Our ontological analysis in the Being in the World series shows that authentic being is ontologically possible within our default mode of being in the world. But merely to theorize the possibility of such a state of complete integrity and mature individuality is insufficient. Call of the Friend shows how to actualize the possibility of being integrity into our everyday life, despite the fact that in being in the world, our individuality is always already lost in the other. Here we identify the ontological roots of the ontic possibility of integrity as wholeness. We also identify existential evidence for practically realizing our possibility for authenticity. In our average everyday state of inauthentic being, we are lost to ourselves. We must find ourselves to achieve authenticity. But first we have to overcome our habitual repression of our potential for authentic selfhood and see that we have an authentic self to find. Something must break through our average everyday inauthenticity to reveal our capacity for authentic being. Our phenomenological analysis shows that the voice of conscience reveals this possibility for us. The existential phenomenon of conscience has many interpretations, religious, psychoanalytical, sociobiological, we neither endorse nor reject those. Our interest is exploring the ontological and experiential qualities of the voice of conscience. We want to examine the ontic possibility of the experience those other interpretations reference, the mysterious change in heart from inauthentic to authentic being. We are most interested in how to approach the existential realization of our capacity to disclose ourselves as lost, and how to call ourselves to regain our personal potentiality for complete, authentic selfhood. The call of conscience is a form of communication that disrupts the idle talk of the other to which we are ordinarily attuned. It elicits us to oppose every aspect of inauthentic discourse. It eschews novelty and ambiguity, and provides no foothold for curiosity. But we must be careful not to misidentify the voice of conscience as endless self-analysis or fascinated narcissistic soliloquies, or the authentic voice can become lost in the idle talk of the other. The voice of conscience calls us to authentic being. It cares not how we appear in the eyes of others, our public role and value, or what we may have accepted as the correct way to live our life. It addresses us purely as a being for whom genuine individuality is a real possibility. Thus, the call is devoid of content. It asserts nothing gives no information about worldly events, no moral guidelines for living. It simply summons us before itself, holding up every facet of our existence, each of our life choices, for trial before our capacity to be truly ourselves. It calls us forth to those possibilities that are most our own. It does not dictate what those possibilities should be. That would only further repress our capacity to take over our own life. Conscience discourses with us always and only in the mode of authentic hearing. Who addresses us with this strange voice that pulls instead of pushes, that listens instead of speaking? Whose voice is the voice of conscience? This is the greatest mystery of life, and this inquiry is the greatest adventure, the highest cause to which a human being can be called. Being in the world described the first step of this adventure, and the second step is developed herein. We cannot identify the caller's specific features, for at first he seems to have no identity other than the one who calls.
the summoner exists only as he who summons us to himself. We all hear this voice within ourselves, so perhaps it is an aspect of ourselves calling to us. However, conscience is more phenomenologically complex. We agree that the voice of conscience is not a voice of someone outside the person whom the call addresses, but neither are we and the caller identical. The person to whom the call is made is lost in the other, but the caller is not lost or fallen. He could not be if his silent voice can disrupt the inauthentic discourse of the other. The key feature of our lostness in the inauthentic self is being unaware of any conception of ourselves as lost. We do not know that we possess the capacity for authentic individuality. Our everyday experience of conscience is a voice that speaks against our expectations, even against our will. We have no plans or desire to accept his demands. Yet something about the call is compelling. The voice of conscience is a paradox. It both is and is not our voice. It seemingly comes from ourselves and yet from beyond us. How can we understand our relation to this call? How is it possible for the voice of conscience to be experienced as a call made upon us rather than by ourselves? Our passivity toward the voice of conscience suggests that it exposes the fact that we are completely absorbed in being in the world. We find ourselves thrown into a situation that we did not choose, but in which we must nevertheless decide how to go on with our life. This is the fundamental uncanniness of being in the world. The state in which we find ourselves is never all that we feel that we are or could be. Nor can we be reduced to mere being in the world, so we can never fully identify with our life the way it is. Thus, we never regard ourselves as fully at home in the life and world we find ourselves inhabiting. This feeling of uncanniness gives rise to the objectless anxiety of being in the world. We do not want to acknowledge this thrownness into unchosen existential responsibility. Indeed, we flee from it. But the voice of conscience recalls this fact about ourselves, throwing us into an anxious confrontation with our potential for genuine individuality. The voice of conscience tries to make us find ourselves, even in the depths of being in the world. This is why the caller who speaks through the voice of conscience is definable only by the fact of his calling. The call reminds us that we are not at home in the world. It speaks from the nothingness that remains when we are wrenched from our familiar absorption in being in the world. Nothing could be more alien to our default being than confronting our potential for authentic existence. The call of conscience summons us to confront our inescapably personal abandonment of our own authentic being. The call of conscience is ontologically possible only because the very basis of our being is care. The call of conscience is often heard as accusing us, identifying us as being guilty. Guilt is conceptually connected with indebtedness and responsibility. A guilty person is responsible for making amends for some deprivation or loss. This presupposes that we are responsible for our deficiency. This guilt is for being responsible for a nullity, the absence of something valuable. The ontic phenomenon of guilt reflects the fundamental ontological structure of our existence as thrown projection. We can realize only one of the existential possibilities the situation makes available. We choose on the basis of the particular state of self and world in which we find ourselves. We never have complete control over our situation or the restrictions it imposes. 
our capacity for projective commitment must always originate from within a particular context, so we can never fully determine its structure. In existing as throne, we constantly lag behind our possibilities. We never have complete power over our own being in the world. This is the existential meaning of throneness. However, nullity is integral to our capacity for projection. For by projecting upon one particular possibility, we thereby negate all other possibilities. Choosing to realize any existential choice determines the non-realization of all others. The nature of our being as care means being the cause of the destruction of the possibilities we choose not to actualize. The authenticity to which conscience calls us is thus an existential mode of being guilty, damned if we do and damned if we don't. Alibis, making amends or reform, might eradicate the ontic guilt of one specific action. But ontological guilt, being an inescapable condition of existence, is the primal and ineradicable original sin. Authenticity, then, first reveals that being guilty is the ontological condition that is most our own. The aim is not to overcome or transcend guilt, since that would amount to transcending one's throneness. The call summons us to take responsibility for the situation into which we are thrown, and the particular projections and choices we make in it. It leads us to make our necessarily guilty existence our own, rather than project responsibility on them. Accepting the call means readiness to take responsibility for our existential choices, to be indebted to oneself. The call of conscience demands making existential decisions in the light of one's authentic potential for being guilty. Our only authentic response to the call of conscience is to choose whether to accept the call or repress it. The voice of conscience is not seeking the adoption of some particular standard of moral right and wrong, some karmic calculus of debt and credit. The response the call seeks is our desire to have a conscience. To cultivate this desire is to engage oneself in the service of one's capacity for authentic individuality. It is the essence of choosing for oneself. In the triple ontological structure of our being as care, as we discussed in Being in the World, a particular state of mind and mode of discourse belong to every mode of understanding. For example, our feeling of uncanniness in being in the world elicits anxiety. Similarly, the mode of discourse corresponding to anxiety is one of reticence, keeping silent. The particular form of self-disclosure that the call of conscience elicits in us is a reticent self-projection upon our own being guilty, in which we are ready for anxiety. This ontic state is resoluteness. Resoluteness does not isolate us or detach us entirely from being in the world. Rather, it returns us to our place and specific caring relations with entities and others to discover our authentic possibilities and grasp them in the way most genuinely our own. Resoluteness is inherently indefinite. No existential blueprints for authenticity arise from this ontology. The disclosures and projections of our resoluteness must respond to the particulars of our situation. Our view of the situation into which we are thrown by life is volatilized by the other's ambiguity, curiosity, and insatiable hunger for novelty. It is only through the disclosure of a concrete act of resolution that a particular context is given existential definition at all. Our place in the world as a locus of authentic existential choice is thus not something resoluteness presupposes, 
but rather something it allows or creates. Resoluteness means projecting upon our existential possibilities from the range of choices most authentically our own. It also means projecting our context as a definite range of existential possibilities, those possibilities we own as mine. Thus, when we heed the call of conscience, resoluteness becomes the context of our life. Thank you.